But I'm going to take you back through um, uh, my journey over the last couple of years, starting um, with this one, my hallmark of our career. Well, I, I consider myself a medical device guy in all the companies that um, uh, Scott mentioned in my past. You'll see a little bit more about those in the next slide, but um, uh, I consider myself to be kind of a seasoned medical device guy that's been through all the functional areas of, of these companies. Uh, in terms of my background, um, I'm now in the middle of Montreal and uh, Toronto in a place called Wolf Island where my wife and I are empty nesters. We have six boys who are kind of divided between the two places. And so we've settled into a kinder, gentler life in, in uh, the pandemic times and uh, sort of replaced the uh, savages with uh, two cats and a dog. And um, I still work on helping companies grow. Um, the theme has been for me in my career, uh, basically trying to help people solve problems. Uh, at the same time, I have developed a, a passion for corporate governance and uh, sit on a couple of boards today and, and continue to focus on helping the, uh, the life sciences industry uh, wherever I can. So let's see if I can figure out which button is gonna move this, there we go. Uh, in terms of the last 20 years, uh, Scott mentioned Cryocath, which was an excellent story, um, notable in that it was a PMA level uh, endeavor led by Steve Arliss, so an amazing entrepreneur. Um, that segued into an opportunity with a company called XL Tech, which had just gone public, an, another <clears throat> a company in the neurology field. Uh, within about six months of arriving, they were acquired by Natus Medical, and uh, really XL Tech led the neurology division, uh, which was a, an amazing ride. Uh, I call it a very aggressive growth period. Um, and it was the experience at Natus and the contrast of being with a, a large, uh, aggressively growing company to um, uh, the opposite end of the spectrum with, with Profound Medical. Along the way, with my passion for corporate governance, I was invited to join the board as an independent director at Profound Medical. And in 2011, uh, shortly after they received commitments, uh, on a Series A, I stepped in as the CEO with six employees and a couple of million dollars in the bank, and um, off we, we went. Um, I'm going to focus my story today mostly on that ride because it did lead to a, a, a go in public strategy, and I think there's a lot to talk about. Uh, but it also led me back to, um, after a brief break, another startup uh, called MindTech, which is... Um, finally trying to have its breakout moment. We'll talk a little bit about that at the end of my presentation. And hopefully the next chapter with a new company uh, called Dixie Medical. This is a company based in Europe and um, has some exciting opportunities for, for my career to continue to grow in assisting them with their growth. Oops. Um, let me go, go back um, one slide and talk a little bit about the Natus uh, bullet ride. When I met uh, Jim Hawkins, who was the CEO in 2007, Natus was about a $300 million company. They had acquired Excel Tech for around 57 million. And uh, immediately we had gone to the Natus playbook for growing the company. Um, it was a rigorous exercise that took about 12 months it included um, over the next four years, four acquisitions. Uh, it was a growth by acquisition strategy that also led to rapid growth in our top line revenue. And uh, it could only be described as a bullet train. Um, quite often we would acquire a company, uh, take the assets of the company, the product portfolio, but leave the people behind. And after four years of um, growing a company through sort of the teardown of, of uh, existing companies, I decided to, uh, to move on to um, an alternative uh, scenario. And that was the profound experience. It was completely the other end of the spectrum. They um, had a prototype on the bench uh, with very promising IP. They had six employees, none of whom had ever really worked in a commercial company. They were all coming right out of the lab. We had a tranched Series A, so we had the first sort of batch of money, but it was uh, based on hitting our milestones 
to create a, uh, an operational plan, a regulatory strategy, uh, figure out the, the solution around reimbursement earlier than later, uh, va va validate the technology clinically, uh, both technically and clinically, and along the way, keep gas in the tank. So we needed to start strategizing our funding sources. And, um, you know, that was, that was challenging at best uh, in terms of our, um, uh, our, our plan and the amount of runway. Um, it all started with um, uh, a very compelling day for me when I was invited to go over to Sunnybrook Research where the technology was developed and actually watch them put a man with prostate cancer in an MRI scanner and treat them with their, with their prototype device. And, um, you know, in 40 minutes, they had been able to ablate virtually all of this man's prostate with millimeter precision without an incision. And a year later, the man proved, uh, proved to bear out uh, that he was cancer free. And uh, the story was very compelling. We had uh, the benefit of some very strong VC backers. Um, and, and for sure, we could not have done what we did without the solid commitment of early VCs like Genesis Capital and, and, and the BDC. Um, we had a long road from a, a, a benchtop device that was literally Velcroed together uh, to a preclinical phase, which was very successful. Having reached that milestone, we were able to get our next phase of, of money um, in the next tranche and went on to do our phase one clinical uh, study, which also was, was um, uh, very successful. And then on to a pivotal trial, which initially started in support of a PMA uh, regulatory strategy, which as you may know, as medical device folks, is a, a fairly steep climb and a very expensive proposition especially when your technology includes uh, an MRI scanner and, and biopsies and, and one-year follow-ups. Uh, nevertheless, we were able to negotiate with the FDA and other regulatory uh, bodies on a strategy that reduced that burden from a PMA to a, a initially a de novo and then ultimately a 510K, which um, was uh, achieved um, uh, after the clinical trial was successfully concluded. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the technology, just to, again, to give you some insights as to what was so compelling about it. This is a, um, a device that is used under MRI guidance. It is used in real time with closed loop uh, imaging. We actually take the temperature that is embedded in the, in the image data as thermography information, and it's fed back uh, into our device. The device is actually a probe which is inserted into the urethra and down into the prostate, we image it with multiple uh, cross-sectional slices, and then we define a boundary of the gland, the prostate gland. And what you're seeing here is us uh, actually in real time ablating the tissue from the inside out, um, and doing so with millimeter precision, which allowed us to uh, minimize the potential risks around uh, nerve damage, and other damage that would cause uh, side effects such as incontinence and loss of sexual function. And again, uh, it's a very um, uh, groundbreaking technology, one that has been embraced by uh, clinicians uh, throughout the world and continues to be um, um, uh, breaking new ground with uh, new clinical applications that uh, Profound is pursuing with, with uh, the, the foundational technology that was developed. Um, you know, the amazing thing about it was that um, from a, an IPO perspective, my audience in general turned out to be the average 65 year old finance guy. And our statistics were one in seven. And I can't tell you the number of times that I had uh, someone discreetly come up to me after my pitch and tell me, that he's the guy, he's the one in seven, and that he wished he had seen uh, this technology before, um, before he had had surgery or an alternative um, uh, procedure. So it was very um, rewarding to be able to, you know, promote a technology that was having such a positive impact on, on the men's healthcare. But ultimately you get to the point where you run out of gas in that tank, and that was happening to us in, 2014, 
And we, at the time, had already developed a fairly robust strategy to develop a, a Series B. But um, we were getting very concerned about you know, who was coming to the table. Um, it seemed to take longer. And, and folks, it, it always takes longer. Um, and we were quite concerned about the uh, follow through on uh, our strategic partnerships who were bringing money to the table, um, new VCs, and even people who were offering us debt financing. And we have to say that at the same time, um, when news sort of got out there that we were pitching a private B round of about 15 to 20 million, uh, the bankers arrived. And I would say it was a bit of a beauty contest. Many of the bankers that, that Francois sort of um, uh, referred to uh, ha have uh, the capacity to do uh, successful micro cap um, issue is, is, issuing. And um, they were aggressively courting us to uh, take us on the road. And ultimately after an exhaustive um, process of evaluating who would be the right partner, we selected a, a bank and a, and a syndicate and went out on the promise of, it'll take a couple of months, we'll do 25 meetings, eight people will take their checkbook out and write you a $3 million check, and we'll move on with um, a $25 million raise. Needless to say, a year later, uh, I had pitched uh, everywhere, and it indeed is not an elevator pitch until you're in New York, in a tower, with about 90 seconds of an elevator ride and an iPad in your hand. And um, it's not an elevator pitch to you do it in an elevator. And um, I can say that I had the privilege. Uh, I counted and uh, I had 216 no's before we got to the pivotal presentation to uh, an investor who had just recently sold his company for $3.2 billion. And on slide eight, I saw the light bulb go off over his head and he said, we got to do this. So up until that time, I had heard every form of no that you could possibly imagine. You're too early. Um, it's too complex. Um, you need reimbursement first. Uh, you're too Canadian. I'm still trying to figure that one out. Um, but nevertheless, we persevered. And it is the hallmark of successful uh, executives that, that get to the uh, goal line because of, of sheer perseverance. Uh, we ended up raising 28 million uh, with the Go Public transaction. It was one of the most complex, complex uh, transactions in 2015 on the Toronto Venture Exchange. It included a reverse into a CPC, a capital pool company. It included debt, um, it included a distribution deal and uh, it took quite a while to close to the point where we were really concerned about whether we were gonna make it. And in fact, it, had it not been for a bridge financing um, with our existing VCs, we would not have made it. Um, so that, you know, success breeds success. And a year later, uh, we actually had the same bankers and the same syndicate come back with a, a $17.5 million bought deal, which continued to fund um, lots of growth. We went from six people to 25 people. Uh, we went public with around 25 people and then quickly um, ba ballooned in growth. Um, I think we got it up to about 60 employees. So we went from this uh, where we started out with no money to a real booth, um, real growth. We went from a 4,000 foot uh, square foot facility to about 40,000 square feet that allowed us to uh, bring in our manufacturing capacity, uh, grow the team, do real research and development in labs. And um, it really was an amazing time of growth. Um, a lot of my personal time really went into maintaining the, um, the need to uh, focus on strategic partnerships. We, at the time, were trying to pitch Siemens against Philips and Philips against Siemens to make sure that um, you know, both, both of them really wanted to engage in partnerships with us. Uh, this is a, a picture of us getting our first uh, real strategic deal with, with Siemens Medical. Um, and that kind of spurred on some additional success in getting the clinical partnerships that we needed. 
Um, we ended up doing a pivotal trial with I think about a dozen clinical sites. We scaled up our ability to manufacture our, our device. It was a very complex device to make. And um, you know, 2011 to 2015 was an amazing uh, period of growth. Again, we went to um, about 60 people and I'm, I'm privileged to say that about 17 of those people actually worked for me in previous companies. I took a year off in 2017, having um, traveled about 2 million miles to try to get that clinical trial uh, going. We ended up in, in signing on all of the sites we needed and I ended up um, uh, stepping away and taking a break and then thinking about my next chapter. I, I also had the same dilemma that Fran Francois did. I felt I had another one in me and indeed um, MindTech was an opportunity to see another new technology in rehabilitative medicine that I found very compelling. Um, and this is a company also exploring uh, a pathway to potentially going public, uh, but doing it in a completely different manner from the way we did it at Profound. Um, and I guess it really just highlights the point that there are a number of different ways to do this. Um, this uh, method that I'm talking about is a direct listing uh, with a private placement that's completed prior to the go public transaction and, and then using what's called a non-offering prospectus. It's a much um, simpler and straightforward process, but perhaps one that carries different risks given the lack of an underwriter and, and banker. Um, so, you know, it's a completely different um, prospect. Uh, nevertheless, you know, there are a lot of different ways to do this. Uh, you know, you're hearing about the SPAC explosion in the U.S., and there are many um, uh, uh, bankers who will uh, gladly take you down that route. Um, and uh, you, you really do need to be careful about who you partner with and their capacity to take you across the goal line. Um, you know, a lot of people ask, why do you go public? And, you know, more often than not, the answer is to raise funds. And it's always an answer that is linked to raising capital. And I think it's, um, I think it's an easy answer, uh, but it's probably the wrong answer because on the other side of going public, you have to do one thing successfully. You have to trade. And to Francois's uh, point, you need a strategy. You need a strategy around uh, investor relations. You need a strategy on how you're gonna manage your, your milestones, your news flow, um, your exit strategy, if you have one. You need to disclose everything. And uh, it is a transparency that ultimately drives you to um, uh, you know, be very, very disciplined in how you talk to investors uh, and, and, the, and the general public for that matter. Um, and you have to be consistent. The markets reward uh, companies that do what they say they're gonna do. And if you have to change your plan, you need to be transparent about it. You need, uh, if you have to pivot, to explain to the markets you know, why you're doing it, what's your rationale, and how it's gonna um, help you achieve your goals of increasing your value and, and rewarding your investors uh, for their commitment to you. So I guess um, just to round this out, you know, there's a lot of things to think about, about why you might wanna become a public issuer. Yes, it's a lot about raising capital because you'll get a premium on your valuation and it may make raising funds uh, somewhat easier but um, there's a lot of overhead that goes with it, uh, not only on the uh, corporate level, but also on the personal level. You will spend a lot of time managing investors, regardless of they are, if they are exclusively institutional or retail. There are many different methods to do this, and I won't get into the details any further than I have already. I'm happy to answer questions. You do need support, and I, I would highlight, as did Francois, the need for a really good legal team and a really good uh, auditor group that you can rely on. And um, you need to really evaluate what the risks and benefits are versus a, a, a private strategy. And ultimately, um, once you make your commitment, you have, to, you have to go for it. You have to persevere and it does take uh, quite a bit of commitment. So that's uh, my pitch uh, to you. And I hope I've uh, shared enough information to spark some interest and I'm happy to answer some questions.